appreciate the chance to speak to you all today and uh, introduce a little bit of our work in autonomy and uh, share some of the lessons that we've learned uh, even in the fairly brief time that we've been on the road here in Boston. So let me tell you a little bit about the company. I know that um, you know, many of you may not be familiar with uh, who we are and where we came from and what we're doing. Uh, we were founded in, uh, in 2013 as a spinoff from MIT. I remember at that time, my main concern was that we'd waited too long and missed the boat, kind of the autonomous revolution. Now, as it turns out, uh, we feel like one of the elder statesmen in the room, uh, having been in this for four years. But uh, actually, my background is in uh, the robotic space, and so I've been developing autonomous technology for my entire career. So we've come at this problem kind of as natives. Uh, when we started the company, we thought that our winning end state was to develop software that could be built into features that you could buy as an option next time you bought you know, your next, in this case, Jaguar Land Rover. We had a partnership with that car company, and we thought, boy, if we could build the next great autonomous parking feature, that would be a huge win. Uh, we quickly realized that the opportunity out there around mobility services was far greater and far more impactful. Bigger economic opportunity, bigger opportunity for social impact. So I don't want to say we pivoted the company because the technology focus was really the same thing. But we started shifting our thinking around not how can we impact the individual car, but how can we impact cities worldwide. We went to Singapore. Uh, we actually founded the company in Singapore, but we got on the road in Singapore in 2015. We started driving on public roads. We were the first company to do so. Singapore, as a country, believes that autonomous technology will enable them to grow in population without increasing the fraction of real estate they're devoting to streets. It's about 12% today. They don't want that to be 15, 18, 20% as the population grows. And so they have really gone all in on autonomous technology. I'll show you one graph that I think uh, explains part of the reason why they're such uh, fervent believers in AV. In 2016, we announced a partnership with Grab, which is the leading ride hailing company in Southeast Asia. So why would an autonomous vehicle company partner with a ride hailing company, I think everyone in the room probably appreciates that. I usually have to explain why. But the ride hailing companies today are the conduit to the customer. We're building a car that can be plugged into an existing network and move people around cities you know, from point A to point B. And so these partnerships are natural evolutions of this space. And it's creating kind of strange bedfellows. Startups partnering with large auto companies, auto companies partnering with ride hailing companies. But this is the evolution of uh, the space and how mobility is going to be realized in the future through partnership between companies that 10 years ago wouldn't even have talked to each other. And now they're engaging in significant partnerships. Uh, we were thrilled to come back and get on the road here in Boston. We were founded in Boston. We're a Boston company. Uh, we had a chance to work closely over the last year or so with Chris Osgood, Chris Carter, uh, Stephanie Pollock's office, Kate Fichter. I think between Singapore and Boston, we're working with two of the most forward-thinking cities in the world around the future of mobility, which is great. We've been driving on public roads in the Seaport District in Boston for the last several months, and I'll show you uh, some examples of that in a couple of minutes. Uh, we formed an agreement with PSA Group, as was mentioned, and recently we announced a partnership with Lyft to actually deploy our services broadly here in North America. So brief snapshot of history. I'll just um, brag for one more slide here. Very proud to be uh, named recently uh, a WEF technology pioneer. World Economic Forum, again, when you think about organizations that are thinking deeply about the future of mobility, this is certainly one of them. Great connections, of course, with Singapore and here with Boston, so we're very happy about that. Um, and then last week, there was a, um, a ranking put out by a, uh, a, a website called The Information, which is kind of an insidery Silicon Valley website, ranking 17 uh, companies that are working on AVs and kind of putting them in order here, who's doing well, who's doing not so well. We were pleased to be ranked ahead of companies like GM, Ford, Toyota, BMW. The only company on the list, as I point out to my guys in the office, worth less than $21 billion, but you know, we're working on that. So. OK. So what are the components of a robust uh, urban mobility ecosystem? I mean, people are going to get around cities in many different ways. What I want to point out here is when we think about autonomous, there's different realizations of autonomous and different things that it can mean. Obviously, there's the personally owned car, which you can park in your driveway park in your parking space at work, and read a book on the way to the office. And you know that's fine. God bless you. When we think about impact of transportation in cities, though, these other elements, autonomous shuttles, autonomous taxis, autonomous buses, offer the potential to move people around either more efficiently uh, or at lower cost, more safely, or all of the above. We are focused as a company on the autonomous taxi opportunity. 
So Singapore, I want to talk briefly about why Singapore is an interesting you know, city, country for autonomous technology. I can tell you that you know, as a company, we get inbound from cities from you know, Boise to Beverly Hills about getting our cars on the road in that particular city. When we think about cities that we want to go into, because we're a small company, we've got to choose the cities we're in very carefully, we look at a number of factors. So what makes kind of an AV-ready city? Uh, and it's a bunch of disparate factors. First, you know, the regulatory environment. And if I had to pick one factor, this would be by far the number one. If you have a working technology and a great business model, but you don't have the ability to legally get on the road, you really don't have any opportunity in front of you. So the right people in the right offices who are thinking the right way about the technology. Uh, the climate helps in Singapore. Um, it's warm and wet. It doesn't snow very much, and that makes things easier from a technical perspective. The infrastructure is great. Again, it makes the technical problem, which is already very challenging, a little bit easier. There's not so much space. They see the need. Uh, drivers tend to behave. People in Singapore actually follow the rules. It's pretty remarkable. We have a couple, we have a video clip. We collected like the greatest hits of people doing bad things on the road, cutting us off and doing other things. It's like two minutes long. Over a year and a half of driving, people obey the rules. It's really refreshing. So that's, that's again, makes the technical problem a little bit easier. Uh, it's a good market opportunity. The population is ready to adopt this technology when it's ready for the road. Uh, there are great universities when we think about recruiting as a company and that pipeline we need to fill of smart people. Uh, the liability risk, we believe, is a little bit more favorable in Singapore than some other markets. And when we attract people, when we finally convince people to come work for our company, there's a very streamlined process to get them a work visa. It takes about two weeks to get a work-based immigration visa in Singapore, which is incredible. That's Singapore. Um, the plot here is really interesting. If I were to pick one chart that I believe, from a Singaporean perspective, shows the promise of autonomous vehicles, it would be this one. I hope you can see this in the back. Uh, we have a vested interest in this chart because this was, in part, generated by my co-founder, a fellow named Emilio Frizzoli, when he was working at MIT uh, and studying the impact and really doing a thought experiment to say what would happen in Singapore if we took the 850 or so thousand personally owned passenger vehicles off the road and replaced them with shared autonomous vehicles. How many vehicles would we need in terms of fleet size to share, uh, sorry, to satisfy transportation demand? And so you got a couple of lines here. These various lines show different fleet sizes and then the, the vertical axis here is the wait time. So for a given size fleet, how much would you have to wait over the course of a day? All right, so peak times, morning and evening rush. Uh, the answer here is at the bottom. The really interesting dotted line here is for 300,000 vehicles. You could take 850,000 cars off the road in Singapore and replace them with 350,000 300, shared autonomous vehicles and meet transportation demand with a wait time of only about 15 minutes at peak and at off-peak, you know, a couple of minutes. And when the Singapore government saw this chart, they said, wow, I mean, this is impressive. And the opportunity is incredible. We'll never take all the vehicles off the road in one fell swoop, but as a boundary condition and as an example of the promise of AVs, this is pretty remarkable. And you can do this type of analysis for any city worldwide. It'll, of course, come out different for different cities due to traffic patterns and how people are moving around the city. Um, but the impact to first order and the possibility is tremendous. So this is why, as a community, we're moving toward this model of shared autonomous transportation. So Boston is more difficult than Singapore. Um, Boston is a city, you know, when we looked at these two cities and put them side by side, we again saw boundary conditions. We saw in Singapore a city that, from a technical perspective, was fairly favorable. Again, the technology is hard enough, but it's favorable driving conditions. In Boston, we saw a real challenge. And we love that. We convinced ourselves that if we can tackle both of these cities and do well in both cities, we can handle just about anything. So Dan Primack writes a newsletter that's kind of widely circulated in the tech industry every day, and he compared driving in Boston to playing against LeBron, game, LeBron James in a pickup game. So I've never played against LeBron James. But I can tell you the driving is harder. Um, but we came to Boston for a lot of good reasons. Number one, again, first and foremost, the people who are able to make decisions in Boston are the right people. We're convinced of that. Uh, the climate exposes us to essentially snow and harder winter weather conditions. We don't want to have the technology only ever be able to be deployed in favorable conditions, so we want to test in these conditions. You know, the way you make progress 
in a technology development effort is to break the system, figure out how it broke, and then improve it. And so we're able to break things fairly readily in Boston. <laughs> Infrastructure, when I say different, I don't mean bad. That's not the intent here. Different means different. Again, when we think about developing this technology, there's a risk that you develop it for a particular system. It's a, it's a particular city. It's optimized for that city, but becomes very hard to transfer to a new city. And so what we're doing by being in Singapore and Boston is convincing ourselves we can actually scale. We can move from one city to the next in a relatively you know, short time frame. And then, of course, in the future, move on to the next city and the next. So different infrastructure. Uh, of course, MIT, Harvard, all the smart people here is a great draw for us as a company. The driving behavior, unique. Um, <laughs> more challenges. I think we've seen more, uh, let's say, you know, difficult uh, corner cases on the road in a couple of months in Boston, frankly, than we haven't seen, that we've seen in many months in Singapore. Uh, the ability to enter the US market, the leaders, as I mentioned. Uh, the ability to serve actual transportation needs. True in Singapore. Very true in Boston, where you have some old infrastructure, some new developments, and new parts of the city, and some gaps, quite frankly, that we feel, as an AV company, we can go from not just being you know, a toy problem or a novelty trip that someone might want to take so they can tweet about it, to serving a real transportation need in the coming months, not years. So that's exciting. Our company roots, and of course, the vibrant start startup ecosystem here in Boston. I'm going to skip this slide, since uh, Chris already showed this. Great minds <laughs> think alike. Uh, in Boston, we're starting to test in South Boston, the Seaport District. We've got kind of a measured, fa uh, phased approach to development and getting on the road and expanding our testing. We've gone through the first couple phases. Uh, we're in kind of the third phase here, where we're driving a few hundred miles. Our partnership with Lyft will have us driving more miles, more frequently, and we're really excited about that expanding this fleet of cars in Boston. We've got three cars here today, and that'll be growing over time. Um, but this is how Boston is thinking about getting AVs on the road. It's not to say anybody, anytime, anywhere. It's to say, let's go step by step, make sure the technology is safe, is safe, and then roll it out incrementally. And we're OK with that. A Couple of examples um, of the things we see in Boston. This is a little bit hard to see, I'm afraid. Um, Buses in, in, in Singapore are just standard bricks. They look like long boxes to our cars. In Boston, they kind of bend in the middle. Uh, articulated buses, we call them bendy buses. Our system didn't know what they were or what to do with them. They thought it was a house on wheels. <laughs> and so if you squint at this, you can see a kind of a bendy bus in the car's eye view of the world from the LiDAR sensor. Uh, seagulls, some of the seagulls that we saw on the road in Boston are as big as small children. And so we were actually detecting those as such and saying, well, we got to stop. We don't know if this bird's going to sit here and have lunch or if it's going to get out of the way. And so again, these, is a, these are just examples, anecdotal examples of the things you have to adapt to when you move from one city to the next. Um, if we can run this video, I'm going to show just two minutes of this clip to show you an example of where the technology is today, A, and B, um, the types of environments that the technology is well suited for today. Because it's not the case that autonomous driving means you can drive in New Delhi at rush hour or Times Square. You know, this is an area called One North in Singapore. This video was captured about three weeks ago. It's sped up a little, obviously, so we can actually see some action. We're driving about 25 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. It's a kind of low to mid density, uh, you know, mid urban, I guess you'd say, part of the city. It's kind of a technology development area in Singapore. So it's not incredibly dense. Um, it's, it, it's a great city for actual use of public transport. People take taxis. They take buses in this part of the city. They take the, the, the subway. It's quite complex from a driving perspective. If you look at actually what's happening on the road in this video, we're passing cars. We're maneuvering through complex intersections where we can't see the oncoming traffic at some times. Uh, there are pedestrians in some places. There, I think there may be a cyclist or two, although there's not too many cyclists in Singapore because it's too hot. My point is to say, even what to us looks like a fairly benign driving environment, to an AV is pretty complex. But this is where the technology is today. I can tell you that this is a pretty good representation of the state of the art in the community. We're doing things on the road here that most other companies in the world aren't able to do. A few are. Um, there's very few that can do much more complex driving than this. So when you think about how AVs will be deployed in the near term, I think it's maybe helpful to think about 
uh, operational environments that look more like this than look like, you know, around downtown crossing in Boston or the busiest parts of your urban core. Okay, just a little snapshot there. We can skip to the next slide. Uh, very briefly, I think I'll actually just skip to the end of this slide because uh, there's a lot to uh, go through here potentially. But we see autonomous vehicle evolution really coming in two ways. One is through personally owned vehicles. And for various reasons, that adoption curve will be, will be slower. It's going to take a longer time for that adoption curve to get up to a significant penetration level for, level for a number of reasons, in part because uh, the business case doesn't allow you to use the most sophisticated, most expensive sensors, and it makes the technical problem, therefore, a little bit harder. But AV fleets, so mobility fleets as we call them here, we see a fairly rapid rise. I believe that when one city in the world gets these fleets of cars on their road and shows that they can be deployed in a safe and efficient manner, we'll see a lot of what I call fast follower cities. A lot of cities will say, we want those too, and we want them tomorrow. And, then we'll, and therefore, we'll see a fairly rapid rise. And so we have some kind of signposts along the way. I mean, these are not all our estimates. These are drawn from a number of different sources. We don't envision that until 2040, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, will we see significant you know, or full penetration of autonomous vehicle fleets. Um, always fun to predict the future. Uh, this is our best guess as of today. Last point to make, you know, when we think about autonomous vehicle fleets, we think about cars moving around a city and what we call rebalancing, moving in an empty fashion to anticipate demand. We see an increase potentially in VMT. But when we think about AV fleets, we also need to realize that the, 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 the trips that these cars are serving will be short trips. Uh, they're not going to take people you know, from their work out to grandma's house for a weekend visit. They're very well suited for the use of EVs. So what we see potentially is a decoupling between VMT and emissions. Electric fleets of AVs have the promise to provide, you know, obviously very safe, but also very efficient and quite green uh, transportation. So this is the interesting byproduct of combining these technologies. Uh, last, I'm going to leave you with a couple of opportunities and challenges around these technologies. One is Boston specific, building, maintaining Boston as the innovation center that it is today. Uh, two is really demonstrating the commitment to AVs, to getting them on the road in a measured way, understandable, but it's a little bit of an arms race among cities, I can tell you, where some cities are offering incentives and saying you can do whatever, you can test however you like. Um, you know, depending on the, on, on the company, different companies will be drawn to different cities for different reasons. So being sure what the playing field looks like and being competitive in the civic dimension. Um, envisioning AV-friendly changes to the streetscape. There was a great slide shown you know, around horses. Uh, transitioning from horses to cars and now from cars to AVs, what should the streetscape look like in the future to facilitate the introduction of the technology? I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but it's hopefully something that you all can figure out. And then educating the public. Again, the fallacy that we'll see these cars everywhere tomorrow. They'll be completely safe. Uh, they'll drive anywhere you want at any time of the day under any weather conditions. None of those things are true. So making sure that people understand the limitations of the technology and therefore don't get frustrated, don't you know, push back uh, when the technology is in fact introduced. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>